Hey there, Robot Makers, how are you doing? Seems to be having a bit of a glitch there with Facebook and Restream, so I don't know what's going on there. So um, I guess it's just the guys who are on, guys and girls who are on YouTube watching this at the moment. 
So let me just bring up my notes and we can make a start. So <laughs> I say so a lot, I've noticed in my videos. So hi robot makers, uh, do you want to build a Pico Cat in Fusion 360? I've got a lot of tips for you today, a lot of tips and techniques on how to do this. I've been blasting Fusion 360 the past week or so um, since getting the full license. So, so, <laughs> so let's dive straight in. My name is Kevin McAleer. Come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let me bring up my keynote slides. So this is part two of the, uh, the Pico series. And uh, like I said, this is part two of the you know, the building it in Fusion 360. And I thought, how can I add some extra value to this show rather than it just being an hour of me building uh, a robot cat in Fusion 360? So I thought I'll tell you a bit more about the techniques that I use uh, whilst doing this. So the goals for this session then is to continue building the cat. I want to show you the, the leg design, the foot design and assembling together the head. It would probably take another hour just to model the head because it's quite a few extra parts. But I thought the uh, the interesting thing is there is how it all sort of comes together. So let's learn some Fusion 360 skills. So the skills we're looking to cover in this session are um, assembling and components, isolating designs from each other. So when you're working on more than one part, this becomes really useful. The derive command, this is really good for reusing parts, uh, as is the insert into current design. We'll look at both of them. One of my favorite ones, and I can never quite get my head around this one, is the revolve feature. Uh, that's, I use that one quite a lot on the SMARS robot, actually, to, to do these sort of profiles uh, and spin them around. So we'll have a look at one of those as well. And we'll look at some shortcut keys, like using the sketch toolbox uh, for getting at commands quickly. We'll look at um, the hole versus the cutout, you know, using a circle and extruding it through. There's some benefits to doing the hole and sometimes it's just easier to do a circle. So we'll look at that. We'll look at mirroring and patterning as well. Uh, doing circular patterns. We'll be looking at the sweep command. This is really, really cool. So if you've got... Um, you've got a robot and you want to sort of model up where all the wires go. I forgot to put holes in this design for wires. And you actually want to model these wires, show you a really good technique for doing that. And we'll also look at uh, fully defined versus non-fully defined sketches and what that's all about too. So some of the problems I've been having this past week with um, Pico Cat, I must be on like version 70 or something now of this thing. Um, so complex models cause problems. And one of the reasons for this is if you're defining a sketch and then you build something on top of that sketch and something on top of that sketch and you, you sort of have this hierarchy, you change something at the very bottom of that because it wasn't quite right. And all of a sudden you, you get these red flags, you get all these sort of errors occurring and you have to go through and, and fix them. And sometimes you get this repeatedly as well. So, and, and Fusion 360 is a is a an ongoing uh, development for Autodesk, so they haven't just sort of built this and it's fixed in time. They're always adding new features and making it easier to use. And that means that there's changes and changes mean bugs. So occasionally there are glitches in there um, that you might have built with a previous version of Fusion. And then as you encounter them in the upgraded version, the bug sort of presents itself still. So that can be a bit of a challenge when you're building these more complex ones. But there's some techniques we can do um, using assemblies to get around this. So one of the things I made a mistake of right at the very beginning of the Pico Cat one, because I'm recreating this from scratch from the from the um, open cat design, was I didn't create things in components. We'll have a look at what those are in a minute and why that matters. Um, but it makes unpicking things in the timeline later on very, very difficult if you don't do that right first time. Uh, the next thing is remembering um, to create each component. Um, have I just mentioned that one? Remember to keep that Remember to create components first for each part. Yeah, so rather than, you, you can create components from bodies later on, but it's much better if you do it from the beginning because the sketch follows that as well. And making mistakes is part of the learning process. So it's the first attempt in learning a fail. Uh, the, the tool and the technique, you know, you need to learn the tool and the different techniques of modeling and uh, don't be put off by this. This is just a regular part of learning. So if, you, if you're if you using Fusion and you think, oh, this is frustrating or you don't quite get that parametric modeling thing, it doesn't work fluidly for you, um, stick with it. It's it's worth it. The payoff is, is huge. 
So assemblies and components, we're gonna get right into this. So assemblies contain multiple components. So this is great for things like the head that we have here. You can see there on the left head, the sort of multicolored version. I'll show you how to switch on that as well. Um, you can see all the different components there. So there's the piece I call the uh, the head profile, which is the kind of the outline of the cat. Think about like a, is it Sheba or Whiskers cat food? They always have like a side profile or pets at home. Uh, then there's the eye mask. Um, We'll have a look at all these individually in a second as well. There's the actual range finder itself, the, the chin piece, which sort of sits on the bottom. Uh, we have the little nose on the end, which is really cute. And then the ear profile that sort of sticks out. I was very tempted to get the little ear pieces for there, but then I thought, come on, Kevin, come on now. <laughs> You're not a teenager. So assemblies, like I said, contain multiple components. And on here, you can see how they all sort of fit together. Nice little animation there. So, um, what are all these pieces? So we've got the profile, like I said, that's the, the side view of the cat's head uh, that all the things fit into. And that's a key thing that all these things bolt to. One of the things I love about this particular version of the open cat design is that all the parts are three millimeters thick. Um, so that's part of their design language. Whoever designed this really thought that, that was a, a good idea. And I'm just looking to see if I've got my little head there. And you know, what you end up with is, is a beautiful sort of 3D object, um, but made very simply from, quite quick to print pieces because they're all flat and there's not very much to them. So you get nice, beautiful, flat sides. Um, very, very easy to print and manage. So we've got the profile, we've got the nose piece on the end. We have the eye mask, as I call it, that the um, the rangefinder sort of pokes through. We've got the chin piece that everything sits on, the servo that locks it all together. And that's the thing that gives this sort of its rigidity. So all these pieces, I mean, this does, does wobble a little bit there. Um, but yeah, the this isn't actually screwed in, it's just pushed in and it's quite quite solidly together there. And then there's the, the ear profiles as well. So that's all the different components. Um, you can see then how they're represented within Fusion 360. So um, this view on the left hand side was when I was looking in the animation um, page, I think you call it, sort of animation section. Um, and you can see all the different components there and why they matter. So we've got you know, head assembly, we've got components within that, and then there's the head assembly. And the version 6.1, every time you save a file, it updates the version number. So an assembly will track a, a set of versions for a particular um, design. And you can see that we've got the ear profile, we've got the eye mask, we've got the nose, the profile, the range finder, the chin, and the basic servo shape. I've got a more complicated version of the servo, um, but that was doing some quirky things. It was like screws appearing in the middle of the air and stuff because I've clearly not modeled that properly. Um, so isolating, this is a really important um, piece, uh, uh, function, I would say. So on the left hand side of the F Fusion 360 screen, you can see all these little eyeballs and you can toggle on and off parts. Uh, but sometimes it'd be really convenient if you could just hide everything apart from the one component that you're actually working on. And that's exactly what the isolate command does. So if you right click on the, the component, the top level of that component, you'll see that there's a, an isolate command right towards the bottom there. And when you click it, you just it switches off all the other parts apart from that one part. And that means you can just concentrate and you haven't got all the other things either in front of or behind or getting in the way. You can just see the component that you're working on. So that was really useful uh, to use that one. And I've only just started using that one this week, actually. Then we have the derive command. So derive is a way of reusing previous sketches that you've made. So you know I, I've done a lot of work in the past um, with the um, SMARS robot. So there's one of the chassis I produced uh, a while ago. So the actual base design for this, I use all the time in them things. So if I'm starting out with, even this crab robot started out with uh, um, the, the chassis design, you can see, I spin them round, they're exactly the same kind of height and width. Uh, just this crab one has a sort of roundness to it. I notice as well, these I've changed from the, the feet to a, a little claw as well on that one. So the derive command is a way of bringing in that sketch from the other file and, and having that link. So it means you can you can delve into, you don't have to use um, the sketch, you could be using an entire component or body, but um, this way you can just pick out the bits that you wanted and you can pick out more than one sketch. So if you've got a few sketches in a file that you want to reuse, perfect for that. And in fact, if you're designing something like this robot cat and you, you might actually plan to, to have some base sketches that you're gonna bring in um, so you might purposely design with the derive in mind. So that's a new thing for me to think about. 
So inserting into the current design is a way of bringing in previous files that you consider to be complete and you want to bring the whole thing in as it was saved. So if you had enabled some sketches, they will be appearing in there. Uh, if you've hidden some pieces in the timeline on that sketch, it'll be whatever you've last saved it as on that particular version. So insert it into the current design, has that link back to the original file. Uh, and this is great if you work in a team of people and you want to um, divide up the work and you're all working on different pieces. You can do this with this insert into current design as a way of bringing everything together uh, as an assembly. So I've done this with the open cap. One of the ways to reduce down that complexity of having everything in a single file was to sort of split all these different pieces out and then have them as assemblies that then go into a single assembly at the very top, uh, which represents the entire cat. So that's what I did on there. Uh, and you can see that it's as simple as just opening up the data panel on the left hand side of Fusion finding the design you want, right clicking and inserting that into the current file. The only caveat is you have to have saved the current file. So if you do a blank file and you try and insert into there, it'll just tell you you need to save the file first. So if you like these videos, um, please like, subscribe um, and comment on the channel. Um, I always say this every time just to uh, get rid of my coffee sign there, um, just to try and get the, uh, the channel to grow. We've just hit this morning 500 subscribers. So for me, that's a major milestone, which means we're halfway towards the, the thousand, which is what all YouTubers who start out want to hit. It opens up uh, extra features in the uh, the YouTube, um, YouTube platform. So that's why it's always important for everyone to, to reach that milestone. So if you can help me out by uh, liking the video, commenting beneath, um, sharing it with people, if you find that of value as well. Um, so let's get back to um, our slides. Okay, so the revolve command, yes, like I said, I've used this one. Um, so th this design that you can see on screen is the Smars Mini. I'm gonna be sharing that this week. It's so cool. Rather than having the um, the chassis with these little um, motors sat in it, let me just push one in there so we can see what that's like. So this is like a regular Smars chassis. Uh, let me just hide that so I can see my confidence monitor better. There we go. So yeah, instead of having, um, you know, the, the entire size of this, I thought, what's the smallest size we can design for? Uh, and I was looking at these um, little pieces, which are the servo holders for this crab robot. And it just inspired me because this was sat on the top and I thought, I wonder if I can design a SMARS that's absolutely tiny. So I've not 3D printed one of these yet. I will be printing one of these this evening. Uh, and I've been thinking about reuse of, you know, to make the parts as simple as possible. So instead of having like a powered wheel and an unpowered wheel, there's just one type of wheel. And depending on what which area you connect that to on this mini, um, it'll, it'll perform that function. Um, and I wanted to make this thing as tiny as possible. So I was thinking, well, how, you know, the, fair enough, the motors are one of the, the largest components in there, but what about like the brain of it? So, you know, we've got our Raspberry Pi Pico, but if I'm going for something this kind of size, that's still too big. Well, Pi Moroni this week launched the tiny, let me show you this thing because it, it absolutely is tiny. So this is it compared to, uh, let's go to full screen for a second. This is it compared to the Raspberry Pi Pico. And if I sort of show you full front there, you can see the little Raspberry Pi RP2040 chip right in the center there. It's got a USB-C uh, connector on it there. It has two buttons, two little clicky buttons and an LED that you can program right in the middle as well. That's the perfect size for our Smiles Mini. So that's going to go in there as well. And the motor driver, somebody was asking about the motor driver. It's going to be the same motor driver that we have in the, um, I don't think I have one to hand unless I can just reach across there. It's the same one that's in the Smiles version four, which is this guy here. So that's about the right kind of size. It's again, just going to be just big enough to fit in there. And then the other thing I've ordered, it should have arrived today actually, I don't think it has yet, is instead of the rangefinder being these usual um, uh, SR04s, there is a little time of flight sensor which is absolutely tiny. It's about the size of that kind of thing. So I'm looking at maybe, you know, can we have that instead of, of them? Will that make it teeny tiny little robot? So that's what I'm going for there anyway. That's what this design is from here. And when I was putting together the wheel stubs, which is what I call these, these areas where the, the wheels sort of connect onto, the way I designed that was by doing a profile. So on the left-hand side here, we can see what the profile looks like. It's this kind of shape. And this is the axis that I'm going to revolve that around. And you can see that on there. 
um, what it does is it essentially just spins that around and creates a solid object from there. I always forget about this when I'm designing things. I usually just create like a circle, extrude it out, and then have another kind of plane and they start cutting pieces out. This is easier. You can start with the most complex piece to begin with and then just revolve it around. So that's the revolve. The sweep command, this is really cool. So, and we'll play with this one in a minute. We'll, we'll actually do a demo of it. So if we've got um, our servo, I'm just looking around to see, do I have a servo to hand? Um, probably not. I never have one to hand when I want one. Let's use this one. So we've got this servo and let's just show you on the screen there. And we've got this wire sort of coming out the back with uh, brown, red and orange wires coming out. And we might want to model that wire because we're thinking about a really small enclosure and we want to sort of model the way that this thing moves around in that enclosure. So the way that we do that is we think, well, what is the, the diameter of one of these wires? So I think on here I've just said one millimeter. They might be actually smaller than that. Oh, it's one millimeter. One millimeter in diameter. And there's three of them side by side. So I've just modeled that out as being um, a sketch on the side there. And then the next thing that we do is we create a Bezier curve. And this one is just like this, this uh, curve that's going to represent the wire itself. And that has no thickness. That's just a path. And then what we do is we use the sweep command to say, here's the profile, here's the path. And it pushes that profile all the way along that path to create a wire. So that's what you end up with. So if you do that three, and you only need one path and you can do the three profiles on that path and they will indeed create exactly what we're after. So we'll, we'll model that in a minute because that's a load of fun to do. And then the whole versus the extrude command. So this one is one I'm always like, mm, it does that really help, is that extra? So normally if we want to put a hole in a thing, we'll just model a circle on a sketch and then we'll just extrude it straight through. But by doing that, we might need to create extra uh, features. We might need to create um, a countersink, that sort of um, that triangular shape, which is that one there. Um, it might have a drill point because if um, we want to have a screw go in there, we might want to model the fact that the screw has that kind of shape to it. It's got this sort of tip to it. Um, we might want to have a thread so we can model the thread. They call it a tap and um, the type of hole as well. So it, does it have a, a sort of square countersink or has it got the sort of cone shaped um, countersink? And we can also place it you know, we can we can have a pattern to them as well. So all them things are available in, with the hole command. And you can also just, you know, shrink and enlarge the hole just with this, uh, this, this tool here. So I find that quite a useful thing to use. I've not used it very often myself. I tend to be 3D printing things rather than um, creating things that need to be screwed together. I mean, you could screw things together. If it be 3D printed, I tend not to. I try and make them sort of all screwless. So I've not used this a great deal myself. I'm looking to use this in future as well. So some general Fusion 360 tips, and then we'll get into sort of modeling some leg and, um, uh, leg and feet parts. So some hard earned lessons. Yes, this is me who's just me making every mistake in the book. So one of the things I always do is I don't look for patterns. I make a mistake of just going straight in there and designing the same thing many times. So look, what is the thing that's gonna be repeated? So, you know, if you're, designing something like this robot that's got these these claws on it do i need to draw each one of them or can i draw one once uh, and if this thing is symmetrical can i draw half of it and mirror it so start thinking about patterns and how you can make use of this thing like i said with the wheel for this smars mini rather than creating a powered and an unpowered wheel that have got different profiles why not just create one that has both profiles but depending on how it's used um you, you only need to model it once so that's one of the philosophies I've, I've uh, that saves a lot of time. So use assemblies to make reusable parts. So you want to think about, again, the reuse side of it. How could I possibly use these in the future? So one of the reasons that this uh, crab robot was so quick to sort of throw the design together is because all these parts are from the quad. So it's very easy to sort of throw this together quite quickly, just reuse them and derive some sketches. So I derive the chassis and the frame and um, the arm and the, the servo holders and the servo itself, all of them things were sort of derived from previous designs. Uh, one of the shortcut keys that uh, I've not been using and I've started to is the S key on the keyboard, which will bring up the um, 
what's it called, the toolbox for getting at commands, command toolbox. So that's really useful. You press S and you can just type in like MI and then mirror will pop up. Sometimes it's a lot easier to sort of go in into all the menus and finding stuff. One of the other ones is locking. So when you define a sketch, um, you might notice at the side of the sketch, sometimes it has a padlock icon on it and sometimes it doesn't have a padlock. And sometimes it'll be black where all the lines are black and sometimes they'll be mostly black but a few blue lines. Those blue lines means it's not fully defined. It means in some way they are not connected to the rest of the design and therefore could change. And that might not be immediately a problem, but when you start to modify that design later on, you might realize that actually, because this isn't locked down, um, it can it can be affected by other constraints and other measurements in your design. So it's really important that you, you get that little padlock. It's kind of like a, a seal of approval. It means your design is fully, fully defined, which means it's not going to move and it's not going to be affected by anything else. So I always strive to try and get that little padlock by fully defining things. And it might just be that you've not connected it to the origin point because that's one way of locking the design. You could just create, you know, a single um, or sometimes two um, construction lines from the origin to the, the sketch that you've created and that should lock it in place. So fully defined sketches create more robust designs. So let's have a look at these PicoCat sketches. So this is the foot, which is, let me find it here. I've got a leg. So that's, uh, the foot is this bottom piece here. Uh, I achieve this in two sketches. Sometimes I try and put everything into one sketch, but that can make things quite complicated to extrude later on. So what I might do is create one sketch, extrude it, and then create another sketch on the new, the new surface with a bit more detail. And that just breaks up the, the complexity of the design. The next one, and we also use a circular pattern on this one, which I find quite interesting. So there's a, we'll have a look at this a bit closer in a minute, but there's a little rectangle on there that I then circular pattern rotate round the center point there. Uh, and that speeds up me having to sort of model that out 10 times. It's also more accurate. Um, so what else have we got there? So yes, here it is in fact. So there's a little rectangular pattern here marked in blue. It's just a one millimeter by two millimeters. It's um, aligned to this centre uh, origin point here. And this little dialog box up here when, that pops up when you click on the circular pattern tool says, you know, what are the objects that you want to replicate? So it's just three lines, one, two, and three. And the centre point is this point just down here. And then it will say, and how many do you want to um, replicate? So I think I might have hidden that actual command box, but there's, otherwise it's just there, number 10. So there's a little box that pops up and you can type in the number of patterns you want to rotate around that origin point. Again, this can be used for all kinds of things. One of the things I did with um, when I was recreating this smart chassis, these two things are opposite. I modeled one and then I just from the very center point did a circular pattern of one that just rotated it round and created this sort of, you know, it's symmetrical, but kind of symmetrical, uh, that kind of line. So the circular pattern was a way of doing that it just meant it saved you know, a couple of hours time doing that. So that's one of the techniques I use there. The neck piece is a really interesting piece. Have I got that hand there? So the original one that I've been looking at here has actually got three different components to it. Let's just show you that there. So there's like this base part and then there's these two bits that stick up. And in fact, there is a, there's an extra two parts. Um, there's one in there. It's, it's kind of like a little strut. You can see that there. And you just push that into place there. I thought, well, it's not a massive part. We could design that as a solid single piece. Uh, and I was thinking, how do we go about this? So first of all, there is there is the outline of this shape itself. On the screen, it's kind of that way. And when I look at a piece like that, and it's got all these nice curved edges, I think, what does that look like without those curves, without all those fillets? What does that look like? And this one is an octagon. So that's what I've designed there. And I designed one half of it and then just mirrored the rest. In fact, you could design just one quarter of it and just rotate that round if you wanted to. And then I then created after 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 creating that sketch and extruded it, which is this version here, you can see all those angular lines. I then just applied some fillets and that created this very smooth looking neck piece. Uh, and I didn't use the hull command to do these holes here, which I could have done. Uh, I just used this, a couple of circles and extruded them through. And then this was quite an interesting shape because there's not many dimensions on it and you don't need to because it's the constraints that take care of it. So that angle there of 45 degrees, is it? 
and um, the width of this, which is projected ge geometry from this piece here, um, that will actually define, because all these things are fully locked together, you don't actually have to define the height of that, it figures that out itself. And then once we've got that we end up with like a, a solid piece we can extrude, I, I do it on a centre plane and then I will extrude it out uh, symmetrically from that centre point and then I will cut down from a, uh, a plane which is at an angle from the top there, tangent plane, I'll sort of just cut it out there and then what we end up with is this piece here and I just added an extra little sketch there um, because this piece doesn't have a way of screwing in the servo horn so I quite like the way it works on the, on the Smiles Quad Robot where you have these, um, these, these little cutouts so you can get that zoomed in there where you've got these little almost like a cheese wedge shape that the silver horn sort of drops into and screws and locks it into place. So I've uh, modelled that and just extruded that too. So that's the neck piece. The leg piece, and we'll, we'll model this up um, in a minute because I think we've got enough time to do this one. It's a nice shape this one. I find this really aesthetically pleasing as a shape. So that's this this piece here. It's quite thick. It's about eight, um, eight millimetres thick with a, a bit of a, let's say 1.5 uh, uh, bezel fillet on on the edge to make it nice and round. It's got these interesting sort of cutout shapes and on the back it's got a hole as well for the servo to push through. So we're going to model that one up as well. Just an interesting design to to work on that one. And so well, let's let's do this shall we? Let me just have a see if there is any other pieces on that slide deck that I need to go through. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's it. Right so let's get over to Fusion 360. So let me bring that up. So the first thing we'll do, we'll, we'll model that um, wire profile using the Bezier because that's really cool to do. So let's go over to Fusion 360. So here we go. So I've got this servo. It's a very basic looking servo there. It's just a single block with a, some arms sticking out, the little circle on top, and then there's a separate component there for the, the spindle piece whatever you call it. And then on the very side here, I've just modelled three circles. Um, so if I just go into that sketch, just double click there, you can see they're just one millimetre. There's a centre line that I've just um, um, constrained that against. It's tangent with the very bottom line. And then I've created two other circles either side of that that are equal to that in diameter and that are also tangent to the middle one and to the bottom. So that just sticks them all together. So it's, it took seconds to create that. So that's the, the sketch that we're going to be working from. And that creates the profile. So if you looked at the wire sort of end on, that's what you would see. Okay, so what we do next then is we'll... Let me just uh, pull out there so we can see what's going on. So I've created um, a plane just down the middle there, just so that I've got a plane to actually sketch um, something onto. And if I then go into that sketch, I just need to move forward in the timeline, I've got this Bezier curve. So Bezier curves are great. You can sort of just create them whatever shape you want them to be. You can have as many different points to it and it will just uh, follow that curve. So it's a lovely interactive. If you've ever played with Bezier curves, they're fascinating things. There we go. Is that how you pronounce it as well, Bezier? I'm sure that's correct. Bezier, Bezier, don't know. I guess it's a French word, French name. I guess it's named after Bezier, some person that probably invented this thing, <laughs> as a guess. Anyway, so it has no thickness, this thing. It's just a path. If you've ever used something like Illustrator, you'll know what I mean by a path. It's just a single um, line. And uh, if we look at it in 3D space there, we can see it's, it's coming right from the middle of that profile. I was careful to make sure that the center point of that um, so that when this profile is pushed along that path it will create the line that we're after. So let's do that next. So uh, if I just press finish there. So what we then do, we go to the create command. We will go to the sweep. We then say what the profile is that we want to sweep. So I'm just going to pick that center one there. We then say what the path is that we want to use, which is that one there. And then look what we've now got. We've now got a wire. We've got this arrow pointing up there as well. 
Um, so you can see, you know, how far along the path do you want it to go? Do you want it to go the whole length of the path or just to the uh, part way through? So you've got loads of flexibility there. Uh, so that's it. That's how you create one. Uh, let me just go forward in time on here because that's all I've done there. I've just done one. I've then gone to the next profile and run the sweep command again. And I've just used the same path. I didn't have to create a third, you know, a second or a third path. It's just the same path. Uh, and then I created the other one. I then applied some color just using the appearance command. So it's gone to appearance and just dropped on some colors of them wires. Um, I assume they're in the correct order. In fact, they're not. So it should be that the yellowish one is on that side and the brownish blackish one is on the other side there. That, that's much more accurate now. There we go. So that means now that we have, um, you know, a way of modeling wires in our designs, we can get really clever with that, just using the, you know, Bezier and just creating a really complicated path. And I have done that in the path, path, in path, in the past with other designs too. Um, and that worked really well. You can actually design these in 3D, which is mind blowing. So you can actually make the points twist and turn as a 3D model. Uh, it doesn't have to just be on a flat plane. So you can get really clever with these things. So that is how we model up that. Just wanted to show you that. And then let's go ahead and model up um, the leg piece. Yes, the leg, not the foot. So what I'm going to do, uh, the first thing I need to do is just save the file. And I'm going to call this foot build along. Like so. And the first thing we should always do, this is a habit now, is we should create a new component. So let's create a component and let's call this one foot, not foot. Let's call this one leg. Okay. So what we want, need to do then first is we need to create that sketch. So I'm just going to create that on the, let's have a think. This is going to be the right side. Let's go for that. doesn't really matter too much. Okay. And what I'll do on here as well, I'll just bring up my notes on my other screen so that I can carry on watching. I really don't know what, I really don't know what went on with um, Restream this evening with uh, Facebook. I just quickly looked on their website to see, you know, was there an issue? And they said, yeah, there's, there's an issue on in Russia, but not one anywhere else. So I'm not very happy that that's not worked. Anyway, we've still got plenty of people watching, which is all good. So let me just bring up my notes. There we go, Pico Cat. Let me just get the sketch up on this other screen just so I can refer to it. There it is, beautiful. Okay, so it's going to be a rectangular shape to begin with. So if I just hit R for rectangle, uh, I'm gonna go from, in fact, yeah, we haven't picked the uh, sketch plane yet. So let's just click on that. So we're in the sketch plane, right? There we go. It can. St I've noticed it flickers a little bit on the screen now. And I think what that is, is um, every time a dialog box pops up, um, the Ecamm software I'm using to share my screen thinks, ah, there's something else I need to, to see. And it sort of resizes the screen, but sometimes it does it really quick and it looks like a bit of a flicker. So I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll try to avoid it happening. So there we go. We'll just create a rectangle. And the dimensions of this are, so from the side it's 68 and from the top it's 21 i think that looks about right right and what we want to do is we want to create either side of that because it's got these really nice sort of rounded profiles to it we want to just create a circle at each end um, there's two ways we could do it. we could either do the circles or we could just fill at the ends um, i think that's the or, or use the um, edge fillet command, which is this one here. Yeah, it's still a fillet command. You can either do that after you've modeled it. You could model it as a solid and then fillet it, but I, I just find this is an easy way of doing it. It's kind of quite therapeutic to do this. So we click on the tangent, we click on the edge, and then the edge we want it to be tangent to. So all those three edges, and that'll just lock it in place. So we don't even have to specify what the diameter is. Um, doing the tangency will define the, whatever the, tan you know, whatever, it's tangent two, so th these will be 21 if we measured them because that's what the width of the thing is. Okay, we then need to have a couple more circles in there. So the very first one we're gonna draw is a tiny one. So I'm just gonna do D for dimension there, and that is two millimeters. So that's going to represent, uh, in fact, do we need that one? Because I don't think we need that one. Let's just go for five millimeters in that case, which is the width of this servo. 
So if we, if we were to sort of measure the servo um, spindle on the end, that's five, the white bit, that's five millimeters thick. And then we need another circle right from the middle, which is eight. So let's just do that. So that's eight. I think that's it for them. We then need another rectangle, which we're just going to sort of draw over here. And again, we're going to use that tangency command to the circle just to make it tangent to that, like so. And then the width, not the width, the, the depth of it is 8.5. I've muddled this so many times. Not 8.5, 19.5, sorry. 19.5, and then there is another line which goes across, not from the middle there, but just across. And that needs to be about 8.5, I think, from the top there. That's not right. From the top to the bottom, there we go, 8.5. And what we want to do as well with these, these edges here, just to make it more appealing, we're just going to get that fillet of 1. I'm going to do that on the same there, fillet of 1. OK. So this is a bit I find really pleasing to look at. Let's just draw some lines from the top to the bottom and then from the middle to the middle, like so. And we're going to make both of them construction lines by hitting X. And then what we need to do next is draw, draw a rectangle, actually. That might be easier to do. Give that a dimension of 30. And... That's also going to be, if I just double click on the edge, if I click once, it'll select that one edge. If I double click on it, it'll chain selection to all the the, the uh, connected edges. And if I hit X, it'll make the whole thing then um, construction line. So that is that we're after. And then because I want this to be centered, I'm going to use that line there and then that line there. Oops, not angle. That line there, that line there. And that's going to be exactly half of that value. So that value divided by two. And then we can just make that line. Uh, actually, we can bring that in. We want to use that line there and then that line there. These are 3.5 from the edge. So let's just do from that point to that point should be 3.5. And from that point to that point should also be 3.5. OK, cooking with gas. That looks good. Right, and then I'm just going to actually extend that line out a little bit just to there and then just to there. I'm going to turn off 3D sketch. That's what's happening there when I'm when I'm sort of sketching and it's getting that sort of perspective view. I don't really want it to do that. So uh, that was that option just just behind my head. Actually, if I just go over to there, there's a little option there for 3D sketch. <clears throat> we don't want that. In fact, if I pop over there for a second, yeah, we don't want to include that on there. These are really useful, actually, to, to remove some of the clutter. Sometimes when you're working, you think, I can't see everything. There's just too much going on. So if I click hide the constraint, you can see all those little symbols disappear. That can be useful if you just want to see the, the dimensions. Sometimes you don't even want the dimensions. You just want to see the sketch because you're trying to find a particular line. Uh, and if you've got any points on there, which is those dots, they usually represent the, the center of an arc. So they're useful sometimes to show other times they're just visual noise and you want to get rid of them and the profile is that sort of light blue picture that picture the light blue uh, effect that occurs when you've got a, a design which is fully defined so in fact if we just open up our little sketch here we can see we've got a fully defined sketch everything's black currently so we've got the little padlock which means we're golden um, even though we've not finished yet <laughs> just from a perfectionist point of view so i'm just going to make that little line there um just a construction line. I'm just going to replicate that down there as well. It's just quicker to do that than mirroring it for these particular ones. So I'm just going to hit X and then X again to make them all construction right. So I love the arc command. <laughs> it's one of the little things that brings me joy. It's like a Bob Ross thing. Whenever I use this, I always think I just love this, I love this command. Where's that sketch gone? There we go. Um, so I'm thinking that's not going to work because we need a point. We need a point there and we need a point there. OK, let's go back to our arc command. Three point arc. We're going to go from there to there and then we're going to just click in the middle. So from there to there and click in the middle. I think that's a beautiful shape. And I think we can probably use that 
mirror command. So before I was saying about the, the toolbox, the shortcut, if I hit S, that brings up the sketch shortcuts. And you can see there, we've got line, we've got rectangle, we've got circle there, some of the quite the commonest um, things to use, but I want to use the mirror. So if I just do MI, I can see there we've got mirror uh, as being the thing that we want to use. If I bring that up and then on here, it says, what do you want to model faces? I think that's actually the wrong mirror command. So let's just go back there. I think it's that other one we need to use. Let's try that one. Yeah, that looks right. So I'm just going to click the center line first of all, which is going to be this line here because we're mirroring top to bottom vertically. Yep. And then we're going to select the objects that we want to mirror across. So I want this line here. And you can see as I'm clicking them, they're, they're beginning to appear down here. So I want that line, I want that circle, that circle, I want that line, and I want these two edges. Let's zoom in a bit to get those. There we go. And that's just quicker than sketching them out. There we go. So that is our leg profile. Let's just finish that sketch. Let's have a look at this in all its glory. There it is. And then all we then need to do is to press um, Q for extrude, or we can hit that extrude push pull button there. And then what we're going to do is just start picking the pieces that we want to extrude out. So on this one, I think we extrude out. Uh, I'm going to say all these pieces apart from that center. I think that's right. Okay, that like so. And we're going to extrude that out by, I think it's eight. So there we go. We're nearly there with that. I'm also going to drop on there that color. So I just pressed A for the appearance. And I've already found um, when I search in the library, I always go for like matte plastic. And there's all the different matte plastics you can have. Maybe we need like a green one or something. I don't know. Like so. And then the other thing I've got on there, just to make this easier to, to see, um, I have a few different options on the visual style. So I've gone for shaded with visible edges. You can just go for shaded and you don't get that sort of black outline of the, the, the design you might prefer that. Um, I used to do, do that, but now I've gone with this visible edges. It just gives you a, an extra cue uh, when you're designing the thing. So what I want to do now is I want to fill it. So there's a couple of ways I can do the fill it command. I didn't realize you can just click on a face and it will fill it the entire face, all the different edges and profiles. However, I don't want that sort of countersunk effects and I don't want all these. So I'm not going to use that one. I'm just going to delete that. I am just going to click on um, this edge, that edge, that edge, and that edge. And I'm just going to fill it them in by, I think, one, one millimeter is fine. There we go. So that is partly the way there. Uh, so what we need to do next, I'm just going to have a just visual check on that to see, does that look right? So there is a little bit that stepped in there. So let's go back to our, let's switch in our sketch for a second. And we've got quite a bit of noise going on there in our sketch, but we can turn them off by looking at the object visibility. So we, if we wanted to see joints or we wanted to get rid of um, other axes and origin planes. We can do that by switching on and off these different work features. If I do that, you can see there it just hides or shows lots of various different things. But what I want to do on here, I want to do another push pull and I want to do it from this original sketch. I'm just going to hide the body for a second. It's it's this um, this piece here. Let me just make sure that's right. Yes, that piece there like so. And equally it's that piece and that piece. I want to push them uh, back into the, the profile. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, but I don't want to do it from from this base, I want to actually do it from this surface here. So what we can say is we can say do it from this object. So from here, I want to extrude back like so. Um, I think three millimeters is fine actually, like so. And if we just hide that sketch again, we've now got that sort of in in you know in sunk. <laughs> we've now got that extruded back slightly. So we've got the area there where the the servo can pop through and the servo horn can go into this section here and sort of lock into place. I'm not sure that's going to work yet, but I'm just modeling up what the, the previous person had defined on there. I think the servo horn would wiggle a little bit on there. Depends how tight the screw is, I guess, but that's the design. That's our, our foot. Um, so then we just need to do, sorry, not the foot, that's the leg. So what we need to do next is our, our um, foot. 
So I'm just going to save that. OK. And then I'm going to do a new design. It's so nice not to have to worry about how many designs I've got open at the same time. <laughs> that was one of the, the restrictions of the uh, free, free version. However, that free version of Fusion 360 has seen me through, what, three years I think I've been using that. It's gone through quite a few different iterations and iterations and visual looks um, over the past couple of years. Um, but fundamentally underneath, it's still the same great tool. I know some people are not keen on it being cloud based, but there's a lot of functionality that you can use that's cloud based, like, you know, rendering things and so on, rendering animations. So if you want to do a lot of that, you know, you don't need to have the power on your machine. You can just pay somebody else to do that in effect and it's quite good value for money for that too um, okay so we want to model up now the foot let me bring up the sketch for that there we go so it's going to be another save the file it's the first thing we need to do so that's going to be foot build along and we are then going to create a component we always create a component so we're going to call this one foot nope yeah, foot. And then what we want to then do is just create a, uh, let's go for the same side. So right hand side and just there, right. So it's going to be another rectangle. So that's going to be 66.5 by, I think it's 19. Right, so let's try using the derive command. Excuse me, I've actually designed this before and I might not be able to remember what these things are. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to highlight this whole thing. And we're going to delete it. In fact, let's just finish the sketch and delete the sketch. Let's use the derive command. So I'm going to go to insert, insert derive, and I'm going to find on here where I've designed this foot previously. So I think there it is, Pico cat foot. Uh, yeah, by 18 to the second I'll do. So selecting that and then it's going to open up that file. And then I can see on here all the different sketches that I previously used. So there's the first sketch. So if I click on that there, it's going to derive, it's going to bring in that sketch from this file into my new file. And we can even say place the object at the origin as well, just to make it so it's uh, fully defined. So if I now go back to here, um, it's warning that that's uh, out of date. So up here we get this little warning symbol and the link. And what that means is that there's a newer version of that. So we just click on that and it'll just bring in the, the, the latest version. So if we just switch this on now in our sketches, you can see we've got this little arrow. That means that it's linked. And if we just zoom in on that uh, and look at it from above, perhaps that might help. There we go. We can see now that we've got this sketch brought in. So let's have a look at this. So I can actually just use that sketch. I don't even need to do anything further. Well, I can just do push pull. Um, is that going to be enough? I think that we need the previous one to make that work. Let's let's just bring it in. Let's just not have any of those complicated pieces just yet. Let's just bring in the whole thing. And yeah, we want that. We don't want that. Oh, it's got that nice little cut out there for the uh, for the server wire. So that looks good. We then need to just define how much we're going to pull this out by. So I think it's instead of being eight like the other one, I think it's seven. So let's just say that's going to be seven, like so. There we go. And what we'll then do, we'll, we'll do the, the hard work on this one. Let's create this. So I know that there's a circle that sits along here and the diameter of it is going to be 12. And we're just going to make it tangent to that edge and to that bottom edge. So I'm just going to click it and then click on there. And then what we'll then do is model out these teeth. So let's go up here. Let's just make it like so. Make it a construction line. So I'm hitting X for that. And then we want that kind of L shape or C shape. Like so. Okay, and then the, the width of this is going to be two millimeters. And these are going to be one millimeter each. And we're going to make them so that they're tangent to here, like so. And then I think we can say, let me think how's best to do this. There's a couple of ways. We essentially want to make this center line here um, centered on our design. So the trick I always use is get the center line, get an edge, and then just say, oops, say that it's half 
of that measurement there. So whatever that measurement there is, double click. So whatever that one is, divide by two. Okay. So what I want to do now, hmm, have I done that right? I might have to, I might have to do that again. I've, I need to create another thing first. Let's, we, can, we can very quickly do that. So this one here, the offset command, what the offset will do is it will recreate the profile of the sketch that you're selecting underneath it um, and offset it by a certain value. So I want this to be minus one. There we go. We want the teeth to be inside there. That's what I made, that's a mistake I made. So let's just do that shape again, like so. It doesn't have to be accurate to begin with. We can then just do the, it's two and then they are, it's really tempting just to type one, but if I, in the future I decide I want them teeth to be a different size, if I make it so that it's a formula, it will change automatically. So that's why I refrain from doing that. I'm then just gonna make this top thing tangential to that there. It does mean we'll have these little triangle pieces here. We'll just have to watch out for when we're, when we're extruding it, but um, we could actually have them on the inside, but it makes, for, it makes for a nicer design if we do it that way. Right, okay, so what, now what we want to do, we want to create this circular pattern. So the objects that we want to um, wrap around are those three. The center point is there. So you can see it's defaulted to three. And I just want to make that to be 10. So I could just type 10 or I can just press this seven times. There we go. Okay, so we've now got the shape that we're after there. Okay, let's just model up the other pieces that we need. So we need a line going down there. That's going to be, I think it's four from that edge piece there. That's going to be construction line. I think we then have another one, which is also four, I think. From there to there. Oops, just four. That's also gonna be a construction line. And then we have that interesting piece. So there's a line that goes from that point there somewhere up there. Um, and we don't need to worry about the angle is going to be. We're going to use this construction line to help figure, us, figure out the point that it needs to pass through. So I know that we need to have a line that comes out here by two and that it's from the top down to there also two. So that creates a point there. And what we want to do is have this line pass through that point like so. Okay, it doesn't really matter if it sort of goes off to infinity there. That doesn't really matter too much to us. Okay, so then what we need to do is we need a um, an arc that forms around there. We also need a little cutout triangle piece here as well. So let's just draw that in just very roughly. So we know that using our parallel lines, that line needs to be parallel with that one. That line needs to be parallel with that one. And that line needs to be parallel with that one. And then the distance between these is going to be four millimeters. So that's four. The distance between that and that is also four. And the distance between that and that is also four. Okay, and then what I usually do as well is I'll just introduce a little, a little fill, um, let's do 0.5 actually. A little fillet on the edge there. So F, oops jumped out the sketch then let's go back in We're not quite finished yet nearly there with this one um, so then let's do the fillet again so we want that edge and that edge 0.5 we want that edge and that edge 0.5 and then we then have a arc three point arc from that point to this line here somewhere and I'm just going to let it find that tangent point there. That'll do. I think that's right. It's going to complain that it's not locked into place because we could move this. And I think what I did on the other design, let's go and have a look, shall we? So this is the foot. Let's have a look in our foot. Click on the wrong button there. Foot. And let's go to that sketch there. Let's just have a look at that sketch. So it's that one. Okay. So how did I guess? That's that sketch there. Let's edit that one. 
All right, it's just five. That should that should be all that we need. So let's go back to our build along, and then let's just give that a radius. It's this radius here, so that should just be five. I think that's all we need to do. Let's just have a think about that. Oh, that's it's the diameter of five. If I right click on that. Um, how do we do this? Well, let's just make it 10 in that case. Yeah, diameter is twice the radius, isn't it? So that's what's going on there. That'll do, that'll do, that's fine. It's complaining a bit about that. It's good enough. Okay, so I think that's everything for that design there. So let's just finish that. And then what we then need to do is just press Q and we can just push out the pieces that we want to uh, cut away. So I'm just gonna say cut on there. We're gonna push them all the way through distances all and then what we then need to do is just zoom in a little bit get rid of that piece there and just cut out these teeth that we want so it's not all the teeth it's just some of the teeth so I think it's that one there that one there that one there let's just do that this might be may or may not be right that looks okay to me let's click okay can you see what's happened there this is one of those um, triangle pieces that I said we'd have to watch for. So if we just go back to that extrude command again and just zoom in right to there, we can see what's going on. We can see that there's a little triangle there and a little triangle there, and then we can get rid of that. Okay. Um, we can actually cut these pieces better as well because at the moment they're just following that that little rectangular shape. And we, if we just get rid of those pieces, we, we end up with a much rounder looking um, piece so let's just do that let's just cut them out like I said there's probably a better way of modeling this so that this didn't happen maybe using a, a construction line perhaps for the top piece uh, actually we want that piece in there that's fine okay that piece isn't quite right and that's the last bit the detail that we need to, to fix and then we're good so it's just complaining about that shape there. There we go. Okay. So now there we go, that's our foot shape. So what I want to do um, just as the last piece then is I want to put them together in an assembly because then we can use that assembly multiple times in our design. Um, so if I just create a new file again, let's just save that. Let's call this one um, foot assembly or leg assembly. Build along. And let's then go over here and then start bringing in the pieces that we've just done. So we've got to insert into our current design the foot build along and we want the leg build along as well, which is in here somewhere. So what did I call it? So there's the foot and we've just done the leg. What did I actually call that? We've literally just been working on it a second ago, so let's just close that out. Foot build along, and I've literally just been working on it a second ago, so let's just find it in here. confused because I can't see it. I think it's that one there. There we go. So it's current design. It hasn't just rendered a picture out of it. Let's just move that back like so. No, I think that's the same one, isn't it? I'm very confused with that. Right. I'll just bring in one that we've, we've literally just um, created. So I just want the leg. I just want the leg. <laughs> I'll do. There we go. And we also want to have a servo as well. So let's just insert that into our current design. Okay, it doesn't matter where they are. We can just close that out now. And then what we then need to do is just connect these pieces together using some um, joints. I've got better at this and I've designed my pieces to be better as well, uh, to be connected together. 
So let's just connect up. Uh, we always connect the piece that's going to move to the piece that isn't going to move. Um, what we'll do as well, we'll just ground one of the pieces. So let's ground, um, let me have a think. Let's grind, ground this piece here. So if I just click on that and click ground, that means that that piece is not going to move and everything else can move. So let's go to this piece and the servo is going to move. So let's just rotate this round so we can see the piece that we want to connect it to. So we're going to click on the joint. We're going to make it a motion a revolute and we're going to just grab that bit there. And then on here, we are then going to connect that to it's actually this bottom piece here. We could move that out of the way, but I can just see it's there. So let's do that. Does that look right? Let's just have a quick look. Yeah, that's that's good enough. Is the orientation's correct? Yep. Yeah. And then what we then want to do is put this foot to this hole needs to go through here. So it's actually this piece here. So let's just do a, a joint here. Uh, let's just grab that piece there. And on here, that's going to connect to that surface and that point just there, like so. We don't want it to revolve around, we want it to be rigid join like so. And now if we look at this, we can grab this piece and um, it's all sort of staying together. Okay, and we also just want to change maybe the color of that. Let's just make a bit of a different color there. So then we've got a leg assembly. So we can build, we can bring that into another design and have four instances of that leg assembly. So each of them will be kind of independent, but we've only modeled it once. So we haven't had to model four legs. And what I've been doing um, with my entire um, Pico Cat is I modeled up the collar assembly. And the collar assembly is those two, it's essentially this piece here. Let's go back to there. So this has got two of the same profiles. I call these the collar pieces. It has the shoulder piece, which is this sort of round profile that these things. So the idea of this is it's got these cutouts to it and these can push through and then they hold it in place. So when you get your, your servo, let's see if I can quickly grab a servo that can push through it. When we get our servo and put that through that hole there, make sure it's the right way around, and we sort of push this into place. When we screw that in there, uh, like so, you can see the holes are aligning. That is a really substantial piece. You know, that's it's solid, it's very lightweight, it doesn't take them very long to print because the pieces are all um, flat and have holes in them. So it's very lightweight, absolutely solid. So that's a really nice design that the original Pico, the original Open Cat um, had sort of a, um, like a, a box that the, the thing went into. That's a much better design. And we've not had to, other than the screws that the, the, the servos are going to screw into the shoulder, these pieces haven't screwed into these. It's just push fits. Really cleverly designed that. So, so I've created one of those as a, an assembly. So it's got two servos, two shoulder pieces, and two collar pieces. And I've then brought in two of those assemblies. So I've got the collar assembly and another collar assembly. Um, I've then got the foot assembly, which we've literally just created now. Uh, we've got the the neck assembly. So we, we just ran out of time to create the neck. Uh, but you can see there, it's just that um, that shape that we were talking about previously at the very beginning of the show. It's just an octagon shape with some rounded corners. Uh, there's then this profile piece that we create and then extrude through to cut it out to make it like two pieces. And then we just have the, um, the servo sit in between those two pieces like so. So we can hide the joints. Uh, in fact, we can turn off the joints on that display there. So let's get rid of all the joint and joint origins, just a bit easier to see. And um, because we've we've modeled this there, you know, we've got the spine piece that's connecting the, the back and front collars together. Um, we've got our neck um, servo and our head servo. And I've also just modeled up um, just before the show the head assembly itself. So the head assembly is the profile the ear piece, the eye mask, the nose, the chin, the servo, and the range finder. And they all just beautifully fit together. Um, whoever designed this, I think what they did is they designed some very flat planes, intersected them, 
cut them pieces out and then measured it and kind of retrospectively designed it based on those cutouts. And it's quite an easy way to do uh, this kind of complex work. Uh, I love that cat head. I think that's such a clever design. I mean, the nose as well. You can see the, the Fusion 360 features now. You can see that whole pattern there. That is a rectangular pattern. We didn't use one of those today, um, but essentially you just create one hole and then you can rate, um, you can replicate it as a rectangular pattern. A bit like the circular pattern, but it does it as a grid. And you can say how many rows and columns you want of that. And then you can go in and tick and untick the, um, the patterns that have been created because you might not want all of them to be replicated. So you can see there it is um, a five by four grid, but the corner pieces are missing because they it wouldn't make sense to have them there. And then they're just mirrored across to the other side of the uh, to the nose to, to speed up the design process. So loving how that's coming together. We hit shift and N, we get the uh, color cyclical version of that. So we can see all the different pieces. Uh, I think that looks quite pretty as well as a design. And I've also gone into the design and I've rendered out a few different versions of that, I think. Or not on this particular model, I've not. I've done that on the... Uh, the other Pico Cats book version 39. There's a there's the one with all the errors in. <laughs> so I gave up on that one. I was bringing each piece in individually, you can see there, rather than using the assemblies. So the assemblies is definitely the way to go. That's one of the tips I've, uh, I've learned there. Cool. So there are all the pieces I wanted to show you. Um, I also wanted to mention that on the website, we've now got a Pico Cat area. So on the menu bar at the very top, there's a little Pico Cat uh, emoji. And if you click on there, you'll find all these videos. And I will be putting all the tutorials and all these build along guides. I mean, what I do, um, I'll actually just show you. I'll bring up on my iPad here. I've got all this sort of step by step um, screenshots and the description of what you need to do for each of the stages so that's all going to go up on there as well so it's like a build along guide uh, and again that just means that it's kind of you know it's more than open sourcing the thing it's really giving it to the community so they can take it and uh, play with it i know a lot of people like to expand these things and extend them uh, as do i do too the other thing i wanted to mention is we do go live every Sunday, I always say we, it's just me. It's literally just me in this room. So I go live every Sunday, seven o'clock uh, Greenwich Mean Time. There are different time zones um, around the world. So I appreciate that everybody can join at the same time that I'm broadcasting. And it's a shame that it didn't seem to work on Facebook today. I don't know what happened there. I can see we've got about half the audience that we would normally have. So it must be some kind of glitch, I think, with Restream. I shall be reaching out to them about that one because I can just broadcast to YouTube for free without having to go through their very expensive Restreaming software. Um, so that's um, that's the call to action on the uh, the videos. And then the last one we have there is the coffee. So some people are very generously donated um, a couple of coffees so far uh, and that's enabled me to buy the full version of the Fusion 360. Um, we put a stretch goal on there as well to try and raise like a thousand pounds and that will keep the channel going for another year. We've literally just been doing the counts this afternoon for because um, I'm a, a freelance project manager uh, and I do this as my hobby but the amount of expense it takes to run a show like this I kid you not. So I'm not going about that too much. If you want to help out, I'm really, really grateful for those people that have. Um, what I'm thinking about doing is having like a credits thing as well. So you can see your name on there. I just need to ask your permission if you want to do that. If you're happy with that, um, then that's something that I will definitely look into. So um, so there we go. So that's the, uh, there is it. There it is. Buy me a coffee thing. <laughs> so buymeacoffee.com slash Kevin McAleer. Um, what else did I want to talk to you about? I'm sure there was uh, one more thing on there. Let me just have a quick look at my uh, my notes. So we talked about that. We talked about the little SMARS uh, mini that I'm designing. I will send the uh, STL files for that. And I'll give you a very quick update as well on the um, Pico Crab. So this was my sort of midweek distraction. So I was putting together the design. His eyes falling out. There it is. Um, this isn't quite designed right yet. So one of the challenges that I've got is these rangefinders come in different designs. Sometimes the the little headers stick up like that, and sometimes they stick that way. And when I designed this, I thought they would stick sort of that way into the into the chassis. Uh, and at the moment they're sort of sticking up. I could just bend them with my pliers. That's one option. Uh, and at the moment, I haven't printed the version that holds this into place properly. So it's just sort of falling all over the place. And they, there's a head version, uh, 
head. In fact, there. In fact, there's the version where I bent the pins. <laughs> That's the one I was actually looking for. Right, because that does actually sit better in there. There's a little groove that it fits into and sort of locks it into place. Uh, but as you can see, I changed out the design of the feet. I went with a, a wide foot to begin with, and I thought, no, it just doesn't look very crab-like, so I thought, I want something that's kind of a pincer. So I've designed the, these crab things. It took quite a while to print, but they're really nicely, really... I, I did it on the super fine versions. So look how smooth those are. Really, really sort of silky smooth. So at the moment, that, that hand doesn't do anything and I was thinking maybe maybe I could put like a little cog on there and as this thing moves up the hand can open or close that's maybe a little extra detail I was thinking about and we can kind of get that motion for free without having an extra servo in there it could literally just be that there's a cog stuck on here and as this moves that cog interacts with that uh, the arm inside so that's something that I'm thinking about and like I said I will also release the uh, Smars Mini can't wait to see that I'm going, to, I'm going to print that. I'm going to start printing as soon as the show's over. <laughs> so I think they're the things I wanted to uh, talk about. The other thing was as well, so yes, as a number of subscribers, we've passed 500 now. I think when I looked at it um, just before the show, we was on about 50, was it 504, 506. Let me just bring up the uh, YouTube channel thingy-mabob on my phone and I can tell you what we're at at the moment. Because uh, it'd be funny when we look back at this in a few years' time, we'll be like, was that all we had? So it's at 509, so that's gone up... Um, it's gone up about 10 subscribers today. So weekends, we do tend to pick up, we, the Royal We, we do tend to pick up a few more subscribers. Uh, and they might be off previous videos as well, not necessarily because of this one. Um, and then in the um, Facebook group, so I created a small robots Facebook group. So if you're not a member of that, make sure you, uh, you join that group. And uh, there's quite a vibrant community of uh, people in there. I started out doing all the Smars robots. I love Smars. It's one of my favourite um, designs of small robot. But I also like other small robots too, such as these guys back here. We've got the Otto just there and Open Cats just there. And I've got a box full of other bits for other robots. Um, so I love creating these things. I love I've got the uh, some more other Smars robots here. That's the the quad, Raspberry Pi powered quad, and we've got the little. Uh, version 4 of the Smiles robot there and my contribution is going to be <laughs> this thing he's looking like one arm at the moment I need to I need to just reprint these pieces a bit too stiff at the moment they're not that should be sort of dangling like that at the moment and it's not it's just a bit too stiff so I need to just reprint them with a tiny bit more tolerance and that can be my uh, <laughs> my first robot that I've designed myself more or less awesome so I think that's everything I wanted to cover off. Let's have a look at the comments and see what people have been talking about on here. Um, so, yes, so Shadowcast was saying you don't seem to be broadcasting on Facebook. That's a restream issue. Um, I was looking at that before, I, just as, as I went live. In fact, if I just share my screen on here, can you see that? So it says streaming issues detected, but only in the Russian region. Thanks. <laughs> I think you'll find it's in my region too, and I'm not in Russia. So that's why that's occurring. Uh, what else have we got on there? So, so um, Shadowcat says, do you find a lot of difference between hobby version and the paid version of Fusion 360? So functionally, the, this, it's the same software. You just cripple by the fact you can only have 10 documents open at a time. 10 is more than enough. It's just they've created this artificial thing where you need to go in and deselect or make read only the files that you've been opening so that's a bit of a pain to do but, you know is it 400 pounds worth of pain probably not the other things are the cloud-based rendering so i can go into fusion if i um head back over to fusion a second if i want to render out a picture let's go to that one there and i want to render out a picture when i click on the render button there i get the option to do a cloud render so I can click on there and then it's usually about one credit to, to render that. And it says it'll take less than 20 minutes. To do a local render, it will take me a minute. So it's not really worth doing in that case. But if I've got a very complicated design with lots of um, different materials on there, it might take it an hour to render that potentially. Uh, I'm on the, M at the Mac M1, which is very fast at rendering anything anyway. So that's probably not an issue. 
But if we was rendering out like a movie or something where it's got to do each frame and each frame's a couple of minutes, it might be easier just to sort of say cloud render it and come back. You can even shut your laptop and walk away because it's doing it on somebody else's computer. Whereas this does use like the full, the fans come on. <laughs> it's the only thing that makes the fans come on on this new Mac. So you can do a local render, but you can also do this cloud render. And they've just got the different standards there. In fact, look at that, no credits required. So if I just click that there, it's going to render in the cloud and you'll see it just pop up here when it's finished. Uh, and it's not it's not taxing my machine at all. I can see my machine's idling, nothing's happening there. And then in a couple of seconds, a minute's time, that'll pop through as being finished. So you can see it's just started there and then it's finished. So then we've got um, this uh, cloud rendered version. So that looks really nice. Uh, if I go up here to click on this, I can download it as all the different options. I can see it's a background is transparent uh, and I can re-render it as a turntable. So it'll that will probably cost a few more credits. Only one though. Uh, any different? I have to do thirty six. And that cloud rendering option isn't available unless you have the paid version. So that's one of the differences. The other differences are um, things like generative design. You can't do that. Well, whether you'd really need that with robotics, maybe. It's, it's like what you'll do is you'll give it a solid object. You might give it a big solid rectangle and you'll say there's a movement, moving part over here and, and this is where it's connected to the other thing. What's the optimum shape for this to be given those two constraints? And it will just run lots of different models and it will figure out the best shape. And it looks like a spider web when it comes out, but like a 3D version of sort of a web. So it's very lightweight, it's very strong in all the right places. Uh, so you can't do that um, in the, the free version. Um, you can render, you can animate, you can't simulate. This is all that um, finite element analysis we were looking at very briefly last week. I did watch a few videos on this this week, so that's pretty interesting stuff. You can look at um, stresses. So if you're designing something and you think, you know, is where's the stresses on this piece? You know, it's going to be on these arms here. It's going to be on where this piece sort of joins to the to the body there this finite element will tell you precisely where that, those are and you might decide instead of having it like that you change the angle or add a bit of extra build material for example so that's what that's great for doing you can't do that in the free version i don't think that's going to be a big problem for most people and i think the manufacturing is not available as well so that's the cad cam I might be wrong on that, but I think that version. Um, so for 3D printing, you can do everything you need to do there. The drawing, you can create drawings, but they're only you can only create a single page. Um, drawings are useful for sort of encapsulation your design in you know in, in a printout. So you know I was thinking about having a few prints on my wall over here just so I can see at a glance some of the key measurements I use again and again and again, like servos and chassis and, and whatnot. So that's the that's the answer to that. So that was a shadow cat who answered that, who asked that. Um, anything else on there? I don't think so. I think that's everything so far. So hope you've enjoyed the show. Um, I hope it's been added quite a bit of extra value there. We went through quite a lot of stuff today. Lots of tips and tricks and techniques to use Fusion 360 and take it to that next level. And we're nearly there now with the oh, with the Pico Cat. So I have designed some extra body struts to be able to sort of mount um the Pico 2 and I'll probably be using this design as well um, just looking around to see if I've got my Raspberry Pi Zero so that's a Pico and it's in like a it looks like a Raspberry Pi Zero type case so what I can do is I can I can derive my new design from this piece because it's got things like these um, these little holes they're all perfectly in there and you can see it's it's in there quite well it's just push fit and it's got the um, the charging hole as well so I might reuse derive the design from that um, onto the Pico Cat, because then we can get to the interesting part, which is the software side. So I'm looking forward to, to building the software. And if you look in the um, Smiles community and in the small robots community, you can see Tom has done some really great work with his um, Smiles robot. It's really, really coming along. I'm really impressed with the, the rapid development that he's done on that. So I need to keep up. <laughs> Great stuff. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, I shall see you next next this time next week, hopefully on all channels and not just YouTube. And I'll probably drop in a midweek video as well. That'll probably be on the um, Smars Mini as well. So see you next time. Thanks, everyone.